After the assassination of Mary's second husband, Lord Henry Darnley, Mary offered a £2,000 reward for any information that would lead to her finding out who the culprit was. Well, I mean, at least she did until it turned out it had been Rebecca Vardy all along, you know. There were certainly plenty of people who had motivation to want Darnley dead. He was a very killable character, you know, universally loathed, like Joffrey or Matt Hancock or something like that. But most suspected that the man behind the assassination was James Hepburn, Lord Bothwell, the man who had come to Mary's defence after the murder of David Rizzo in March 1566. Sam even pointed the finger at Mary herself. In Edinburgh, some quite graphic placards began to circulate that depicted the Queen as a whore. You know, which would be an interesting new design for the back of the £20 note, that one, wouldn't it? And so Bothwell, in his usual bullish manner, he challenged anyone that accused him to take him on in single combat, which I don't think is the ideal way to prove your innocence. You know, that'd be like Oscar Pistorius challenging anyone that thought he was guilty to a running race. So we got, <laughs> me lady, anyone who thinks that I did this, I will challenge him to a race because I did not give you know, that night, me lady, I am innocent, me lady, me lady, me lady. As soon as, as, soon as the starter's pistol went off, that'd be him, wouldn't it? Floods of tears, he'd be all over the place. Now, Mary, she actually allowed Darnley's father, Matthew Stewart, the Earl of Lennox, to accuse Bothwell in front of the Scottish Parliament. But the whole thing was a complete farce because Bothwell was himself a member of the Privy Council, which meant that he was responsible for organising his own trial. He just set up at the back of Downing Street, out in the garden, but he rambled some shite about how he needed to drive to check if he was blind or not. Next day, he was back in at the day job. And so an emboldened Bothwell, his next move was to invite 29 of the most important lords, earls and bishops in Scotland to the Ainsley Tavern on Edinburgh's Canongate, where they signed the Ainsley Bond, which basically meant that they would support a marriage between Bothwell and Mary. But listen, you know what it's like, you know, you go out for a few pints with your pals, next thing you know, you're signing a contract that will promote the career of the shadiest character you've ever come across, a man who in the future will commit a sexual assault. It is how I assume the BBC dealt with contracts in the 1970s, you know? And so Bothwell, he made his marriage proposal to Mary, and when Mary turned him down, he simply abducted her. He abducted her outside of Edinburgh and took her to Dunbar for her own safety. And it was at Dunbar where Bothwell allegedly raped Mary. Now Mary, her honour, her political credibility had been jeopardised and she felt that the only way to legitimise this sexual encounter was by actually marrying Bothwell, by marrying the guy. And so on the 15th of May 1567, in a Protestant ceremony at Holyrood Palace, Mary and Bothwell were married in what is, even by third marriage standards, a pretty miserable affair. There was no celebrations, there was no guests, there was no jubilation. It was a COVID wedding 450 years before COVID weddings were even a thing. A public revulsion at the marriage quickly turned to rebellion. Another bond had been signed by the Confederate lords that pledged to rescue the Queen from her dangerous husband. They kept running folk over in his Range Rover. They put an army in the field and they faced off against Bothwell on the 15th of June 1567 at Carberry Hill. Now Bothwell, his army wasn't large enough to give fight. He was just posturing. It was the equivalent of sending gunboats to go and defend fish. And so Bothwell, he had to flee the battlefield. He was now a, an outlaw on the run. And Mary, she crossed the battlefield and she surrendered herself to the Confederate Lords. And if Mary was expecting a, a dignified, respectful reception, reception on account of the fact that she was, after all, the leader of Scotland, she got a rude awakening. As she crossed the field, she was heckled with shouts of We Jimmy Cranky and Ay you we Nippy and whatever other shite part that they come out with. Mary was taken to Edinburgh, but she desperately wanted to go to Stirling to see her son because at that time, the Queen's son wasn't a sexual deviant who would delay family holidays so he could go visit a billionaire's private island who had sexually, who had basically human trafficked underage girls for him to have sex with. You know, James was only 10, 12 months old. And so Mary, she wasn't taken to Stirling, she was taken instead to Loch Leven Castle, which is a castle built on an island in the middle of Loch Leven near Kinross. At Loch, at Loch Leven Castle, Mary, she miscarried twins, presumably Bothwells, and she was forced to sign deeds of abdication. She was told either abdicate the throne to your infant son James or we are going to kill you. So a distraught, dishevelled, clearly ill Mary, she signed the deeds of abdication. She signed the deeds without even looking at them. 
like a property developer on homes under the hammer. And so James was now king of Scotland, but Mary, she still had her, her sympathisers, her supporters. In particular, the keeper of Loch Leven Castle, William Douglas's younger brother, George Douglas, and his adopted son, Willie Douglas, uh, known as Pretty Geordie, they had become infatuated with Mary and they were determined to help her escape. And on the 2nd May 1568, during May Day celebrations, they managed to break Mary out of Loch Leven Castle roared to the shore. Mary's supporters flocked to her cause and she made her way west where their support was strongest. She was trying to get to Dumbarton Castle but her route was blocked by the Confederate lords at Langside which is now a, a suburb of southern Glasgow. From the viewpoint of Mount Florida Mary had to watch a demoralising defeat play out in south Glasgow essentially and Langside below her. Uh, it's something that I can personally empathise with. You know, being an Aberdeen and a Scotland fan, I too have been witness to many demoralising defeats in that particular part of Glasgow where Hampden Park is. At least she was at Mount Florida where she could just jump on the train and get back into town quickly. And so now there was no question that Mary was going to make it to Dumbarton Castle. So she went south to the Solway Firth. And it is at this point that Mary made arguably the worst decision of all. And she'd made a lot of them up to this point. Her advisors begged Mary to sail to France where she had estates, where she had powerful allies and where she could launch a counterattack. But instead, Mary was adamant that she would go to England and throw herself at the mercy of her cousin, Queen Elizabeth. I mean, it was ridiculous. The obvious choice was always Europe, not England. It wasn't a choice at all, really. But still, Mary felt this need to cling on to England for no particular reason. Very difficult to imagine in the year 2020, I know, right? And so Mary, she crossed the Solway Firth and on Sunday the 16th of May she stepped onto English soil for the first time where she would spend the next 18 years in captivity before her execution at Fotheringhay Castle on the 7th of February 1587. Since her escape from Loch Leven Castle, Mary had managed only two weeks of freedom. And I bet she wishes she just went to Disneyland Paris instead, you know. And I'll tell you the end of the Mary Queen of Scots saga next time. Thank you so much for listening.